Well, good morning. You guys can do better than that. Good morning. My name's Tom Noblet. I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Ridge Community Church. And uh, I just wanted to welcome you guys here this morning as I adjust my microphone. And if you're a guest today, we're so glad that you're here. And uh, I've got a couple quick announcements for you. First of all, I wanted to let you guys know the last two weeks I've been at Oak Ridge City. And it has been a blast. And here's the encouraging part of it. For all of you that have supported that, which is one church, two campuses, that have financially supported that or have prayed for that, I want to let you know the, the neat thing was, was I expected to walk in there and know most of the people. They've been getting two to three to four families a week as new guests, and I didn't know half the people there. So that's a, worth a round of applause. So obviously what you've been doing has is, is been good. With that said, uh, if you're a guest today, I've got a few specific announcements for you. The first one is we ask that you not give. We ask that you just sit back and connect with God. Uh, but the second group of people that call Oak Bridge their home, I want to ask you guys a question. Do you trust what Jesus says? By show of hands, do you trust what Jesus says? Yeah, and you know what? There's no better way to trust than what he says than to obey when he asks you to do something. So I'm going to read something to you that, he, that was recorded in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Here's what Jesus says. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, will be measured to you as well. So Jesus does say that, hey, generosity leads to generosity for one another and from God as well. So the encouragement for you is, is I would just remind you at this time of offering when you have the joy boxes, that God's faithful. He's true. And if you said you believe him, then I would encourage you to look at your giving and to see, is it a faith-based giving? Do you trust God and has rewarded you accordingly? So that just be one thing. The next thing is, if you're our guest today, we'll tell you that we don't offer communion in this worship service. But there's a room right behind us called the Reflection Room, and you can go in there and take communion. You can have prayer. There, there's people with teal shirts on that will uh, welcome you. And uh, it's just a good way to take communion and to remember God and to, to, to leave some prayers. we got a great morning for you today. we had a great service this morning. I hope you enjoy it as well. So what else you got? Um, my name is Laura Campbell. Uh, if you're a guest here with us today, we also would love for you to step outside and go to our information center. You can pick up a new guest brochure. Inside is going to tell you some information about our church, and then um, you can get a free drink from our cafe, and you can also get a free t-shirt for you and everyone who's here with you from the Connect Room. So if you could head out to the information center after service and pick that up, that would be awesome. Um, we have some really cool events happening here at Oak Bridge the next couple weeks. So the first one is tonight. Um, at 6 p.m., we have have our first EDGE service of the semester. Yes, yeah, so we're super excited about that. We have a fun night planned for the kids. Um, it starts at 6 o'clock. This is for any kids um, in seventh grade going up to seniors in high school. Um, Josh has a message planned um, for the kids that's just going to be really helpful for them as they start this new school year. And then also we have an after party of a silent disco. It was a huge hit last year, and we know the kids are going to have a great time. You so said silent disco. That's what we're going to have a yeah. silent disco. Any of you guys do not know what a silent disco is? Raise your hand. Yeah, they have headphones, and they've got four different stations you can turn these headphones to. And like one will be blue, one will be red, one will be green. And you'll see people dancing. There's no, if you turn your headphone off, there's no music in here at all. But you see people dancing, and then all of a sudden a good song will come, and all of the headphones will turn green or red. People will turn it to the station, and then their dancing will change. So one people's like grooving like me, you know, like really grooving. And, <laughs> Anyway, it's amazing. I can't wait for tonight. I, I'll do it for about a, a half hour. But what's so cool is you get to come before the silent disco because after the silent disco in this room, it smells like armpit. Mm -hmm. It's terrible tonight. That's Whew, true. Man. Yes, so that is tonight. So get your kids up here. Have them invite their friends. Um, it's just a great fun party and um, just celebrating that Jesus loves us and we are for joy. Um, also, next Sunday we have a baptism service in service. Yeah. So um, typically we have them in the afternoons, but next week we're doing it during the morning service. So we encourage you to come. Um, if you're interested in getting baptized, there's um, someone out at the information center that will talk to you about what those steps look like and someone who will talk to you if you're interested in doing that next week. Um, also, next yeah, week... Laura, real quick, there's seven people signed up, and it's not going to be the whole service. They'll baptize them, some of them at the beginning of one service, and then some at the beginning of the other service. But if that's your next step, go around right to the counter, sign up, then Herc will give you a call during the week to explain what's going on. Anyway... Um, also, next Sunday after service, we have an Explore Oak Ridge luncheon. So if you're interested in going to that, you can sign up online. Um, it'll be after second service, and there will be lunch provided. So if you're interested in just knowing a little bit about what Oak Ridge does, um, what they 
feel is important. So come to that and you can kind of get to know a little bit more about us. Yeah, one last announcement. I could get fired after today if you guys don't help me. So you guys all got to listen in right now. All right. We're going to do a cool thing with honey today. With honey. H-O-N-E-Y. All right. And they're going to come along and they're going to have a little bottle of honey. And they're going to pass down the aisle. You just put a little dollop, just a little drop on your finger. Not on the chair. Not on the ear of your person sitting next to you. All those things. Just on your finger. And when we do that at the right time, then you can taste the honey. And it'll fit in with the message. You guys ready for a great morning? Yeah. Uh, Stand up then and say hello to somebody and say, I'm ready for a great morning.
you can go ahead and take a seat if you will. Before we sing uh, this last song, I want to give us the opportunity to do something that's kind of unique and different. Maybe you've never done it before. But you know, guys, you know when kids start school, age first grade, what do we call that? Elementary school. That's right, elementary school. Then when they start the next age group, what's that called? Middle school, right? Then high school, then they go into college. The question is, what would it be called at the time when Jesus went to school 2,000 years ago? What were the Hebrew uh, teachers, what were their classes called? Well, here's a little teaching on it for you. The first great eight, when you became about age six, if you're a Hebrew boy or girl, you went to a teaching class, and it's called Bet Safer. Bet Safer. Say Bet Safer. And what that meant was House of the Word. So if you're a rabbi, which is the uh, Hebrew word for the English word teacher, if you're a rabbi, you'd have Bet Safer, House of the Word. That's where they start at age six. And the goal of that for those four years was to learn God's Word. And they had the Hebrew Scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. It's the first 39 books of your Bible. And by the end of Bet Safer, the, the, the thought was, was they wanted to have you memorize the first five books of the Old Testament that was called the Torah. Say Torah. Torah. That's what it was. So you went from Genesis, Exodus, Exodus Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and those five books you had to have memorized. That's what they wanted. So you'd say right now, is that possible? You know, of course it's possible. You memorize songs, recipes, addresses, phone numbers, but they were studious at it. And one of the ways they'd get them to learn was they'd give each of the kids a slate, a little black slate, and they'd have either a piece of limestone or chalk if they had it uh, cut out that way. And the kids would write down the scriptures that the rabbi would teach them, and they'd memorize these scriptures. But it said, and it still happens in some Hebrew schools today, it said on the first day of every year when they'd get there, the rabbi would take everybody's slate and said, look, I want you to pull out your slate. So all the students would pull out their slates. And then they would take honey, and they would wipe it all over the slate, and they would wipe it all over their fingers. And then the rabbi would look at the students and say, the word of God is sweet like honey. The word of God never spoils like honey. It's the one thing that never spoils. So taste, wipe the honey off your slate and taste it. Wipe the honey off your feet, fingers, and taste it. Taste and see, that is the word of God. And every opportunity we have to read God's word is sweet. It's like honey. Remember, they didn't have Ted Drews, they didn't have Briar's ice cream, none of that. Honey was the sweetener. That was the treat. That was the, 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 the thing that made everything, uh, the meal worth eating, the honey. So the question is, is when was the last time that you ever looked at God's word, even read God's word, or thought about God's word, and said it's sweet like honey? And it never goes bad, it never spoils. It's always powerful and true. So I thought today what we could do is for five minutes, we could read a scripture verse that when the kids moved up, up further and got into Bet, Met, Bet Medrash, they would learn the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, which would have been 34 more, the minor prophets, the major prophets, Psalms, Proverbs, and so forth. They would learn that by memory. And a little story was, was uh, in the Bible, we see where Jesus at age 12 went into the temple. And he starts speaking to all the rabbis. And scripture says they were amazed at how much he knew. So apparently Jesus was a good student that knew his scriptures and was ahead. And I think he w I believe that because I believe he understood the value of God's word. So right now the ushers are going to come around and they're going to just pass honey and put it on your finger. Pass the bottle down. You just put a little dollop on it and go ahead and taste it. Taste it. And what we're going to do uh, we're all going to read out loud together some scripture verses. And we're going to start with Isaiah, but before I read Isaiah, so here's the deal. I want us all to understand what we read is sweet and good to the mouth like what? Honey. That's what we would have known. That's what Jesus would have seen. That's what he would have experienced. But before we read the book of Isaiah out loud together, I want to read something from Psalm 119, 103, that surely Jesus memorized and surely the rabbis taught because this was written thousands, a thousand years before the time of Jesus. Here's what it says, Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And the rabbis would have taught that. Now we're going to read Isaiah 53. This is from one of the major prophets in the Bible. 
a, a person that God used to bring forth his word, his teaching, his admonition. You can read it. It's in the Old Testament of your Bible. as the prophet Isaiah. Now, this is a scripture that if you would have read it roughly 2,700 years ago, you would have probably not known who this scripture was. But we have the advantage right now of after this was written, hundreds of years later, Jesus came. And we know what this scripture was talking about. So I'm going to ask you to put on a, a Hebrew boy or a Hebrew girl's mind. We get to read the word of God. You should cheer wildly right now. We get to hear the word of God. We need to read it. And we get to read it together. And it's sweet and it's true and it's life-giving and it never spoils. With your outside voices, Isaiah 53, 1, please join in with me. We have the privilege of reading God's word. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whose people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the, though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And he has suffered. He will see the light and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Now in full voice, ready, read this last sentence. For he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. That's what they would have read. That's what they would have memorized. Now we can move forward to what would be called the Christian scriptures or the New Testament. And here's what we read that Luke had recorded. In Luke 1, 26 through 33, let's read this together. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Jesus, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign, now, reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And all God's people said, Amen. That word is sweet like what? Honey. I hope today this, this, this little part here will cause you to say, how would you have done in Bet Safer? Maybe it would have been better for many of us to, instead of learning the, the arithmetic, reading and writing, to learn God's word. I wouldn't argue that. But there's the chance, because of today, because of technology, because of our access to God's word, for all of us to grow in it. This day forward, whether you're 15 or you're 85. In a moment, we get to hear a song that is probably one of my top five songs ever. And it's the truth of our heart. If you're here today with a Christian, it's my guess that they do not think they're better than you. They know they're not better than you. But it's also my belief that the person that has invited you here today, they know a person named Jesus. 
And they want to offer that same person to you. And they want you to know him in the same way that it's possible. So we're going to sing this song, but before we do, we're going to pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. It stood the test of time. It is sweet like honey when we apply it. It never spoils. It's as true today as it was originally when it was penned. It can change our lives, dear God. It is life-giving. I pray that maybe this morning, that this makes us think about how we treasure it, how we value it, what we do with it, and what it can mean to us. God, we love you. We thank you that you're not here to condemn us, but to save us. Father, we thank you for your kindness, which leads us to repentance. God, most of all, thank you for Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all God's people said. I want to give you a moment just to pray to God, to understand that God is for us. 
Proof of that is Jesus. When people see a four shirt, it's just a simple thing. What's that mean? It means that God's for you and he's for me. How do you know that? Because we can look at Jesus and know that. Nobody does that for somebody unless he loves them. Go to God right now in, in prayer of either gratitude or just asking for God for something. Father, we can come to you boldly because Jesus is our advocate. He's our go-between. He's the one that opens up the door to your ear, God. We thank you for what you've done for us through your son, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. God, I pray that today we come out of here more in love with you than we came in, more wanting to follow you a little bit more, more wanting to be in awe and wonder of your word. Dear Father, I pray that this hurt gives today's message that it does for those in this service that it did in the first touches our heart, helps us to understand more, to take another step. God, I thank you for all you've done. I thank you for our church, people that serve here, that attend here. I thank you for the online presence. And I thank you for Oak Bridge City, dear God. God, guide us and touch us. Our heart is yours. Our ears are yours. For the next 30 or so minutes, Father, touch us deeply. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Turn your eyes towards the screen. I said at the first service, that's a little eerie, like, lead-in, isn't it? It's kinda, I, don't, I don't know if I like that one too much. But, um, Chuck, thanks for that song. It brought me to tears over there. Wasn't that just awesome? That was totally cool. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the church, is, it's all about Jesus. I love that every week I get to get read that. And, and, you know, this God, Jesus, the one that created everything, he set this world up, and, and there's principles that, that dictate what goes on down here. And we're going to be speaking about one of these principles over the next couple of weeks. And, and I'm going to be bold enough to say that I think if we can grasp this, if we can use this principle to our advantage, then, then it can lead you down a path of life that, that brings peace and, and lasting happiness, less regrets, prosperity, joy. Um, so we, we need to get this. It's an important one. But um, it's also kind of a, a heavy one, I think, that some of us, it might just, you know, smack us right upside the head. And so today's message, I hope it's challenging. I hope it convicts many of us. But for some of us, maybe you're like, look, I've lived my life according to this pattern, used it for my advantage, this, this principle, and, and things are going great. And I applaud you. For the rest of us, um, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll allow us to change and we'll be humble today. But um, since it's heavy, I thought we'd start off a, a little lighthearted in here this morning. How many of you guys are animal lovers? Animal lovers? Okay. I've got a couple dogs. And um, I, I, I think, and I like him, and, and we've got one named Charlie. I've talked about him before, a big old golden retriever, and he's just goofy and flops around, and he can kind of get himself into trouble. So I like the dogs, but um, I'm really liking this grandpa thing with my grandson because me and him are tight, and he comes over, and we hang out. But, you know, once he starts getting cranky, I just hand him right back to mom. And um, so I'm thinking when these dogs are gone, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do the grandparent thing with the animals going forward. So, but I love them. But, but again, Charlie's goofy. And these pictures are not of him, um, but they could be. So let, let's look at this first one. All right, that, that, that could be, he gets in the cupboard, eats bread. That, that could be him. How about the next one? Totally, I could picture my, my dog doing that. And this third one. Right, we, we've got a hammock in the backyard. And if I let Charlie up there, he would do that. And how many of you guys love cats? How about this next one? Yep, so <laughs> kind of getting into that. Let's, uh, this next one's pretty weird. Could you, wouldn't that have been kind of cool seeing that? I'd like to know how that ended, that big old turtle where he's going. So, and then this last one. 
And that just scares the tar out of me, all right? So, so animals sometimes can be a little silly, a little goofy. Little kids the same way. I was just kind of looking on the internet and saw some things that our tech team spliced together. So there's a little video of some little kids in tough spots. Let's watch this. Camden, get out of there. Get down. Did you use the putty? <laughs> they got himself in a mess. <laughs> Let's try a little harder. Ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> One more time. Last time. Here we go, Jelly. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Abby, don't fall down. Oh, my goodness. Are you okay, Hannah? <laughs> Little She's a bit lighter. Here, let me see. <laughs> She's upside down. She's upside down. <laughs> she went like totally. Oh no. Damn it. <laughs> he might have to sleep here. <laughs> Braylon, what happened? What happened, Bray? How'd you get stuck? So yeah, it's kind of good. So you know, so with, with our pets, with, with our kids, if we don't kind of guide them down a pathway, they'll find themselves in all kinds of crazy predicaments and situations. And you know, unfortunately, I would say that, that we're not much different than these animals and, and the little kids. Right? Maybe right now, um, many of us in here, and I'd say probably most of us, you've got an area of your life right now to where, where you're in a situation that you would have never envisioned. You're stuck. You don't know what to do. You feel trapped. And maybe more, even, even more frustrating than that is, is that you've actually been in the same situation previously in your life. Or at least one that's very similar when you're at an earlier age. And, and you vowed, you were determined that you were never going to end up here again. That you were going to do something about it. As a matter of fact, maybe you worked on it and you thought you had fixed the specific problem or the situation that you found you're in. Right? But then again, you... You're back to the same place. And, and I guess what I'd say is that maybe you thought you had fixed it, and that might be why you're back to where you're at now. And let me explain. I had some car problems recently. And those, car, that, that car, those cars needed to be fixed. That was a situation that needed to be fixed. My youngest son, Colby, started high school this past week, and they passed out Chromebooks to all the students. And Colby didn't know the password, and he couldn't get online for a couple of days. And, and that situation, that computer problem, needed to be fixed. Last time I was up here, if, if some of you remember, I gave just a ringing endorsement of the Ryobi 40-volt lawn trimmer. You guys remember that? Yeah. I went home, used it the next day, and the head fell off. All right? Now, I, I can tell you it was user error. I just hadn't tightened something. But, but that needed to be fixed. See, all those things needed to be fixed. But generally speaking, people don't need to be fixed. See, we might think we have a specific problem or situation that needs to be fixed, but but really, we don't need a solution for that. We need a new direction. See, we need to take some, some new steps that lead us to a new path. We need to change course. And so I want us to do a little reflecting. When I switch gears from the kids and, and the animals over to us, I'm guessing a, a situation, a problem popped into your head in your own life. And maybe it was relational, maybe it was professional at work, maybe it was in your academic world if you're a student, maybe it was a physical issue, a physical problem. Maybe a financial problem where you're just stuck. Or maybe even a spiritual issue. And that issue might be the very reason you're here at church today. And I don't know what it is, but here's what I would tell you. See, you've gone down a path in life. You've made a series of decisions, I have as well, that's led you to your current reality. And I'll say this, there, there are things that happen in life that, that are outside of our control that, that sometimes you know, come crashing down on us. But I'm also, again, equally sure 
that again, you've made a series of decisions. You've gone down a path that could explain why you were where you were at today. It's led you to where you were at. And I don't think we always look at it this way. I think oftentimes we look at our individual decisions, our individual actions as just that individual, that they're disconnected and, and the events throughout our lifetime are just kind of individual things. But they're really not that way. See, each decision, each action that we take is actually a step in a direction. And when you put all those steps together, whether you like it or not, that's the path that you've chosen to go, on, to go down, and it's led you to where you are at today, for better or for worse. I'm going to make a bold declaration. A lot of the stuff I'm going to say today is, is pretty obvious. You're going to say, wow, you know, and, and hopefully it, it hits us. Maybe we haven't really thought about it, but it, it's not, not sci, you know, big scientific things here, just stating the obvious. But I'm going to make a bold declaration and say, if we all left this building today, we went out and got in our cars, and we all hopped in our cars on, and drove down Highway 55, drove for 94 miles on Highway 55, we would all end up in Cape Girardeau. Would you guys all agree with that? Okay, some of you might be saying, is he trying to trick me here? Not trying to trick you. That would be the, the distance. So we'd all end up in Cape. We'd all end up in Cape. Because there's a principle at work here, and a principle that we're going to try and own for the next couple weeks, and it's this. Direction determines our destination. Direction determines our destination. The path that you're on, the path that you were chosen, deter will determine where you arrive, where you are going. And again, this isn't earth-shattering. It's pretty obvious. Farmers understand this principle. Right? The, the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, he says, what you reap, you will sow. See, the world's based on principles, and these principles, they keep life from being totally random. Sure, some random things happen, again, that are out of our control, but, but in general... We can look at where we're headed by the path that we're going down, and the results are pretty predictable because direction determines our destination. And again, this is a principle that's based on a book that we have in our bookstore called The Principle of the Path. And I would say this, nobody wants to get stuck. I do a lot of weddings, a lot of marriages, and I've never had anybody that starts off and they say, yeah, we're looking down the road and we just see disaster ahead. I mean, that's our dream for our... Nobody does that. Right? We've got dreams. Right, we've got goals, we've got wishes for a bright future. We want strong marriages. We want fruitful friendships. Right, we want financial freedom. We want job satisfaction. We want physical health. We could go on and on and on and on. So we've, we've got these dreams, we've got these desires. But I guess the question would be is, why don't we arrive later on in life at those dreams and those desires? See, too often, I think that we believe that we're going to end up there just by willpower or, or maybe just sheer luck. We think we're just going to drift into a good marriage, or we're just going to drift into good relationships or a good career. And that's not the principle that we're talking about. That doesn't work that way. So I want to say it again. Our direction determines our destination, but I'm going to add one thing. It's direction, not intention, that determines our destination. So we can have the best intentions in the world, and I would say that we all do, but it's the path that we choose to go down that will lead to results. So for instance, a single woman might say, I want to meet and marry a great Christian guy who really has his act together. But then she goes and dates whoever asks her out just because the guy's cute. A single guy says, I want to have a great sex life once I'm married. But then he practices with every girl that he dates along the way. Or he regularly looks at porn. A married woman says, I want to have a great relationship with my husband. But then she elevates her children above her husband makes her, the kids a higher priority. A husband says the same thing, but then he goes out and he works crazy long hours, never takes his wife out on dates, never sits down and has an intimate conversation with her. A young Christian says, I want to develop just a deep and lasting relationship with our God. So he gets up early in the morning, but instead of reading the Bible, instead of praying and starting his day off, what he does is he scours the internet and just finds all of his news from the papers or the different websites. A young man, a man says, I want to grow old. And I want to take the latter years of my life and I want to invest them in, in, in the life of my grandkids, the time that I've got. But then he neglects his health, eats whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and things don't turn out the way that he, he had planned or hoped. A couple says, I want, I want, we want our children to develop a, a relationship with Jesus and we want them to have friends that, that are doing the same and lead them in that direction. But then they skip church nearly every weekend for recreation. Newlyweds. They want to be financially more secure than their parents were uh, when they get to their parents' age. But then they start off their marriage with just mounds of debt. 
spend more than they take in. A high school freshman says, there's a college I want to go to. I want to choose this career. And then he blows off the next four years and his grades suffer and he doesn't, doesn't get to where he wants to go. See, we've got desires, we've got dreams, we've got good intentions, but those aren't good enough. We've got to understand and get this principle. It's the path, the direction that you're headed that will lead to your destination. So see, the decisions that we're making right now not only will they impact the short term, but they're going to impact the long term many years down the line. And this should probably be a little scary for us, right? Because we're making decisions right now, taking steps right now that are going to have a huge impact on situations that we don't even know about, right? The decisions we're making today, you might be young and not married, and you're making decisions that will impact your marriage years and years down the line. So what do we do? We only go around once. What do we do? And fortunately, we have some guidance. And I love what Tom led us in. I, I, I hope that we value and understand the, the treasure, the honey, the sweetness that we have in the Word of God. And this is what the writer of Proverbs says, a man named Solomon. He says this in Proverbs 27, 12. He says, the prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and they pay the penalty. And see, in this verse, he describes really the two types of people. He says there's the prudent, which a synonym for that would be the wise. And then he says that there's the simple or the naive or the foolish. So we'll take a look at this wise person. And basically what he says is that this person who is wise, the prudent, he understands that all of life is connected. He's aware of the relationship between the choices that he makes today and the circumstances and the experiences that he will find himself later on in life, for better or for worse. See, a prudent person, he stands on the pathway. And he understands where he's come from, so he looks behind, but then he also looks forward as far down the road as he can, and he makes his decisions accordingly. Because again, he knows that what he's doing today will impact in a huge way what will happen tomorrow. It's all connected. So a wise person draws on these past experiences and, and looks at their future and the hopes and dreams that they have, and, and they choose accordingly. Tom has is, is used this phrase a lot here, and I think it's a great phrase, a great, a great line that he borrowed from another pastor, and it's one that should be, that should be buried in our DNA here at Oak Bridge. But, but basically, when a wise person makes decisions, this is kind of the process. It says, in light of my past experiences and looking ahead to my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing to do? See, that's a prudent person. A prudent person looks ahead and sees danger and says, I better do something. So the wise person makes the phone call. He has the awkward conversation. She cuts up the credit cards, changes the phone number, breaks up, moves out, finds new friends, cuts back on the traveling, sets the alarm clock for Sunday morning, empties the liquor cabinet, joins the support group, joins the small group, changes jobs, uh, cancels the internet and cable subscription. The wise person sees the danger ahead and takes action, does something. But that's contrasted with the, the simple, the naive, the fool. See, he lives his life as if it's disconnected. What I do today has no impact on tomorrow. And they probably don't believe that it's disconnected. They know that there's a correlation, but the scripture says here they live like it's disconnected. And then Solomon says they pay the penalty. They pay the penalty because, again, they don't anticipate. They don't look down the road. They don't see the danger. They take no action. They just continue to barge down the same old path, and they pay the penalty. And those on the outside, and we've all seen it. We've looked at other people's lives. It's amazing how clear it is in the lives of other people. Right? But we look at other people's lives, and, and, and they get to a spot, and we say, well, what did they expect? I mean, they were headed in that direction. It was clear where they were going. And quite frankly, the people, the simple, the naive, the fool, they think they're going to be the exception to the rule. And there are. And we're going to talk about those. But the wise person says, I don't want to base my life on luck. I don't want to flip a coin. I want to go down the pathway that leads to the destination that I want to go to. And see, the simple person finds them in situations, and they never look inward. They, they don't look at the path they've come down, the choices that they've made. Instead, they blame God. They blame other people. But ultimately what this principle says, one that we can bank on, good or bad, it says the path we choose that we willingly go down, it's the path that brings us to our destination. Again, pretty obvious. But I guess the question that I have and, and, and a lot of us have is, is why do, there's a lot of smart people that make a lot of dumb decisions. 
that find themselves in a lot of sticky spots. Many of us. And I guess why? Shouldn't at some point, as human beings, we reach a place where, where we quit making the same old mistakes over and over again? What is the condition that causes this, this propensity to go down the wrong path? And see, primarily, I believe it's a heart issue. Too often, rather than seeking the truth and what's honorable and, and the most, what we do is we, you know, the things that, that are the most beneficial to us, rather than going on a truth quest in our daily lives, what we do is we go on a happiness quest. And this quest, in, this quest for happiness, it often trumps our pursuit of what's true and honorable and ultimately what's good for us in the long th- run. And see, I don't think wanting to be happy is a bad thing. Tom gave a message a few weeks ago, and, and, uh, and, and I think God's for our happiness. God's for our freedom. And as a matter of fact, I think oftentimes there's a lot of overlap when, when we go down a pathway and we choose the right things. I think oftentimes there's an overlap, and those things produce happiness in us, but not all the time. See, sometimes happiness, or at least the perception of happiness, points in one direction. It brings us down a path this way, but then... Wisdom and integrity and truth and common sense, they point in another direction. There's a problem with the happiness quest. Because see, the happiness quest, uh, what makes us happy today, doesn't necessarily make us happy tomorrow. We bought, Christy and I bought a new Honda CRV about a month ago. It's Christy's car, so I get her hand-me-downs. That's kind of the way it works in marriage. It's, I'm, I'm not bitter. I'm cool with it. Um, and so now I'm driving her car that's the 2010 Grand Caravan. And before that, I was driving the, a 1992 Chevy Cavalier, which was Tom's gift to his daughter Katie when she was 16. Okay, so, so that car is about being put out to pasture. So I've upgraded to the t- 2010 Grand Caravan. Christy has the brand new CRV. And, and yesterday, I did a wedding in Columbia, Missouri. So I was able to drive the, the Honda CRV, right? And it brought me some happiness. It was amazing. I sat in there, and it had the brand new smell that you get. Right? You could just barely tap on the gas, and that sucker was going. The engine was so quiet, there was a couple times I was sitting there, I'm thinking, did it turn off? I mean, what, what's going on here? Right? And it brought me happiness. I actually enjoyed the drive there, enjoyed the drive back. But you know, that's going to wear off. The love affair that I have with that car will soon be gone. And that car is going to betray me. It's going to cheat on me. It's going to break down. And I'm not going to be happy anymore. And again, you you guys know this. Not rocket science. But I'm stating the obvious. See, in choosing our pathway, in in choosing the direction that we're headed, I think oftentimes we choose the path of least resistance, the one that brings immediate satisfaction. But remember, the wise person, the wise person looks ahead and makes decisions in the here and now that will have a great impact on their future and their future for good. We've got a tendency to choose the temporary over the lasting because we've got a heart condition. And the prophet Jeremiah, I think he nailed it. In Jeremiah 17, 9, he says this. He says, the heart, the human heart, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Thank you for those uplifting words, Jeremiah, right? The human heart's deceitful, beyond cure. Nobody can understand it. And I think we've got to be honest. Right? We have to believe and, and really understand the fact that what Jeremiah says is truth. See, we need help. We all have an amazing propensity for self-deceit. We can talk ourselves, I can talk myself into a whole lot of decisions, into a whole lot of steps that are simply not wise, that are not good for me, and maybe even for the people around me. I mean, I say, I deserve this. Just one more, what's it going to hurt? I can control this. I need the newest and latest. Everybody else does. Look at everybody else. I'm going to be the exception. We say me, 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 on and on. You get the deal. But see, in order to put this principle into practice this morning for our good, we've got to be brutally honest with ourselves. The heart is deceitful. And on our own, we can't fix it. The heart will lead us astray. It'll take us down a path that leads to regret, to chaos, even destruction. And truth is our friend and our ally in this situation. We've got to understand who we are. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, Jesus says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God's for freedom, 
That's why I wore this t-shirt this morning. And it's not much fun to admit that our own hearts lead to destruction. Right? That they don't lead us down a wise path. That's kind of sobering. But once you realize that you can't trust someone, if you've ever had a salesman, you know, once you realize that they're really not trustworthy, it's easy to look through their schemes. It's easy, no matter how good they make it, it's easy to say, no, this isn't good for me. This guy's a scam artist, you know, whatever. Our own heart, we need to see it that way. So again, if I can't trust my own heart, if I can't trust myself, what do I do? Scripture addresses it, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We talk about this a lot. A lot of you probably have it memorized. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So what do we do? If we can't trust our own heart, what do we do? We trust God. See, we trust the creator of life. We trust the one that set all of this into motion. We trust our heavenly father. We trust our daddy, the one who says he's our friend. We trust the one who wants best for us. We trust the one who sent his son Jesus to save and rescue us. See, we need less of our own understanding and more of of God's. We need to rely less and less upon our own heart and trust and rely more and more upon our Heavenly Father. In every area of our life, it says. It says, in all your ways, in all your ways, submit to him. And that word submit is a really hard word. See, we're proud and we value our independence. Nobody likes to submit. But if we want to go down the wise path, if we want to lead, if we want to head to a destination that, that is good for us and those around us, one that leads to freedom and joy, then there's no other choice. We have got to rely upon God's wisdom and submit to Him. So if we want that divine direction, if that's really our only hope, then we have to understand that divine direction begins with submission, begins with submission. In other words, we've got to learn God's ways. We've got to have a value on the word of God. We've got to understand his wisdom, his commands. And here's the key. Not only do we get them up here, we've got to actually obey him. We have to submit to God in all of his ways. That means our finances, our relationships, our parenting, our marriage, who we want to date, our work ethic, our morality, who we sleep with, when we sleep with them, all of these things, we need to do it to his way if we want to find the pathway that leads to life, not our own. And here's the promise from the scripture. It says, he'll make your path straight. And what he's not saying in here is that if you love me, If you trust me, you can go ahead and do whatever you want, and then I'll come to the rescue and fix it. No, there are consequences to our actions. What he is saying is if you submit to me, if you put my ways into practice, if you learn my ways, then I am going to illuminate the path that you need to take. I'm going to make clear to you what the right path is. And you know, that's really the bottom line message today that I wanted to get across, is that if we want to to head to the destination that most of us desire and seek, the dreams and hopes that we have, the joy and the peace that we long for. The bottom line is that you got to trust God, and you got to do it His way, and we need His help, and we have to submit to Him, and, and ultimately that will lead us down the path to freedom, but it only comes through submission. But I think a lot of people, here's the problem that I want to spend the next few minutes on, I think a lot of people, they think that only super Christians can do that. And I think sometimes it's even reinforced in the Bible. We'll read these these great stories of people who accomplish great things, and we say, there's no way I could ever do that. I've lived my whole life a certain way. It's too late for me. I've messed up. I don't get all this stuff. I just can't do it. Josh told me, I think it was Friday. I'd been discussing with him what I was going to talk about, and he said, hey, Dad, there's a message that I want you to listen to, and I think you could use part of this to maybe end and, and, and wind down what you're saying. So I listened to it, and this man in the, in the message, he told the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And maybe many of us have heard it. You probably heard it in Sunday school if you were a little kid. But, but Daniel was a believer in God. He was a prophet of God. And he was working in the government under a pagan king in, in a foreign land. The, the land had been taken over by a, a man named King Darius. And Daniel was an old man at this time, probably in his 70s, close to 80 years old. And we're told that Daniel was a, was a higher up government official. He, like, he was in the, the top three of the government. And we're told that King Darius, this pagan king, actually valued Daniel. He liked Daniel, and, and Daniel was a great worker. But there were some suck-ups in the government. 
Right? And these, these guys in the government, they decided, uh, I think in order to suck up to King Darius, but they, they made a rule, they, they declared an edict that said uh, that no longer could you ever pray to a, a, another god or another man. All your prayers had to go towards King Darius. So they deified this king, and, and King Darius actually rode off on it. So I'm not too arrogant there, but saying all the prayers have to be directed to me. And we're told that Daniel ignored that edict, ignored that order, and that he went and he prayed, and, and some of those government officials saw, saw Daniel praying, and they went and ratted him out to King Darius. And King Darius liked Daniel and wanted to save him, but he was bound by the law. So we're told that, he, that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den in order to be ripped apart and, and torn apart by these, these lions. And we're told that he spent all night in the lion's den, and King Darius, before he went in, said, may your God help you. And the next morning he rushes there and and miraculously, we're told that, it, that an angel from God closed the mouth of the lions and, and Daniel came walking out. And he says in this story, he goes, obviously there was a miracle there and some great things. They said, but wouldn't it be cool, and all of us, wouldn't it be cool to have that kind of faith that Daniel had? See, he didn't know whether he was going to be eaten alive or not. But it didn't matter. He trusted God and he says, I'm going to do the right thing no matter what. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to have this faith. And, and to me, I don't know if I could have that. And many of us sit there and say, that, that's superhuman. I mean, when you're faced with death or denying your God, who, who would choose not to deny your God to, to save your life? And it would be cool. But, but I think what we miss is that that mountaintop experience was preceded by some things. And we get a clue in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 says this, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. So in other words, he ignored it. We said that earlier, went and prayed three times a day, giving thanks to his God. In the NIV, it says, just as he had done before, but in other translations, it says, as was his custom since early days. See, we look at it and say, what faith he had. I could never do that. But what we miss is probably for years and years, since he was a young boy, Daniel, three times a day, had looked toward Jerusalem and prayed to his one and only God. Right? Think of the intimacy that he had with him so that it led him to a point where he could do great things. It was this pathway that brought him there. And then this, this preacher went on, and he talked about a guy named Alan Stein. And Alan Stein is a performance coach, and he, he's written a book called Raise Your Game. And in this book that I'm going to read from, he talks about a time when he got to meet Kobe Bryant. And I don't know, any basketball fans in here? Not many. This church sucks, then, if we're not got more basketball fans. What is that? Sorry, that's not good. I shouldn't say that. Basketball is the sport. So Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest players ever, started in the mid-90s, played until like 2016, five NBA championships. I mean, one of the greatest players of all time, set all kinds of records. And this, this man, this Alan Stein says, can I watch you work out? Right, so Kobe Bryant, at the height of his career, allows this Alan Stein to come in and work out. And this is what Alan Stein writes about this experience. He says, for 45 minutes, I was shocked. For 45 minutes, I watched the best player in the world do the most basic drills. I watched the best player on the planet do basic ball handling drills. I watched the best player on the planet do basic footwork. I watched the best player on the planet do basic offensive moves. Granted, he did everything with surgical precision and superhero intensity, but the stuff he was doing was so simple, I couldn't believe it. Later that day, I went over to him. And thanks again, I said. I really enjoyed watching your workout this morning. And no problem, Kobe replied. Then I hesitated, not wanting to sound rude or worse, condescending. And I said, you're the best player in the world. Why do you do such basic stuff? And Kobe flashed that gleaming smile of his, and he said, why do you think I'm the best player in the game? It's because I never get bored with the basics. See, he knew that if his footwork wasn't razor sharp, then the rest of the mood would never be as good as it could be. He knew that the only way to do that was through sheer repetition. If someone at Kobe's level needs to commit hours to practicing fund the fundamentals, then so do all of us. Kobe taught me a pivotal, a pivotal lesson this morning. The basics are simple, but not easy. If they were easy then everyone would do them. And see, here's what I think. I think many of us believe that we've got to have these mountaintop experiences. We've got to have big stuffs for adults. We've got to have, we've got to have just miracles to straighten us out. 
right, to get us to where we want to go. God's got to come in and do some super intervention, give us some type of magic pill, some secret that we've never come upon before, some crazy divine intervention story. But we never think, could it be as easy as reading the Bible and praying every day? Could this be as easy as not missing church, but being here consistently and worshiping and encouraging one another? Could it be as easy as joining a small group, getting involved in regular service to other people? See, could it be this easy that we just have to do the basics and then repeat them over and over again, these small steps? See, could it be that it's not about the fancy behind the back passes or the shaking and bacon? but it's the repetitive footwork? Could it be that it's spending less than you earn? That it's taking a day off to just rest and unwind? That it's sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him? That it's getting together with other believers and confessing your sins and letting others into your life? Could it be as simple as watching what you eat? Giving a full day's work? Going on dates with your spouse? exercising daily, giving thanks in all things, putting down your cell phone and actually listening to your kids? Could it be as simple as reading God's word, believing him and putting his ways into practice and then getting up the next day and doing the same thing over and over again? Could it be that easy? See, could it be that that these basic steps, these simple rhythms, these simple patterns in our life lead us down a pathway that leads to a destination of peace and joy and prosperity. Here's what I'd tell you. I think so. I think so. So that should be good news. Maybe we think it's for the super Christian, but it's not. It's for all of us. Getting down to the basics, submitting to God, understanding that our our pathway, that our direction leads to our destination and obeying him and doing things his way. Could it be that simple? I think so. And we're going to talk more about it next week. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, simple but not easy. And we need your help. Father, we have hearts that lead us in the wrong direction. We need hearts that are in tune with yours. We need a new heart that thankfully you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we need to lay aside our own understanding, the ways that that bring us down a pathway that leads to so often to destruction and and despair, and we need to start trusting in you, the creator and sustainer of this universe. Father, we need to understand that you know how we're made, that you know how you wired us, that you know what's best for us. And Father, I pray that we have the courage and we have the guts to submit to you in all of our ways. And Father, I also pray that we understand that that what we are doing today has a lasting impact. It impacts not only our future, but the future of our children and our grandchildren and those people around us. So God, I pray that that we start to understand this principle, that direction leads to our destination and that we use it wisely and we get on your pathway and we trust you for the results that you promise in your word. And Father, we need help. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your guidance and we need the help of others. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand up.
before I let you go, I just got just a couple quick comments to make. First of all, I don't know how God can use an hour and a half so much to fill my soul and to heal my heart. Do you guys feel the same way? I just don't understand it. Yeah, I knew what Herc was going to talk about this week. And uh, in two weeks, I have hip replacement surgery, the day after Labor Day. And I didn't know this, but I had to go in to the uh, doctor uh, the other day, which was two day, three days ago, and they, uh, they drew my blood. Now, I'm a diabetic too, all right, which simply means that I think I can eat a lot of stuff and still take this pill and have my numbers come down. Well, after they took this report uh, and drew the blood, the nurse comes back to me. That was a, uh, a gal that I'd met a week earlier, and she says, I'm just so disappointed in you. She says, you're point one below what the acceptable blood, uh, sugar blood level is to, to, to do surgery. And uh, I told her, I said, you know what? I said, it's crazy. I said, but I didn't think you were going to draw this blood for another week or so. And I intended to eat well this week. <laughs> and you know how you like cheat those tests? Like you lose 10 pounds. Yeah, I've been pretty good shape. And you bloat back up, right? All those things. And I said, I intended to. And uh, she says, well, you know what? She says, can I explain this to you? And I said, yeah. She says, there's three types of diabetes. I said, three? She says, yeah, you have diabetes too, right? Which is not good, all right? And she says, the next one step up is diabetes one where they're going to have to give you insulin. And she says, doctors are finding out and researchers are finding out that there's the third type of diabetes, and it's called diabetes three, otherwise known as Alzheimer's. She says, have you been experiencing any memory loss? And I said, yep. She says, anything else? I said, well, I'm sweating more when I sleep at night. And she says, you can intend to lose weight all day. You can intend to eat right all day. But until you take the steps to do it, it won't make any difference. Now, can you imagine that this week, that's what she told me. And now you just heard what Herc said. What are the odds? Now, maybe God said something to you as well. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe it's a forgiveness issue. Maybe it's a, a parent your kids issue. Maybe it's a patience issue. But he loves us. God loves us. He didn't send us to condemn us, but to save us. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance, to turn back to God. He is for us. I can't wait to hear what Herc has to say next week. And uh, I hope you too as well. Father, we just come to you, we just thank you. We thank you that you put people in our lives that sometimes we, you, you just use them. We don't understand it, but you do. Father, I pray for every person that's in here today, young or old, that they understand it. It, it's just taking one more step. It doesn't have to be a, a bold step, a lightning step. Just pray. Just read. Just stay steady in attendance. God, so much hangs in the balance. I thank you so much for your son. I thank you so much that you're for us. And all God's people said, amen. See you guys next week.